all for being here tonight, uh, this afternoon. Um, and let me first say um, that I'm so incredibly thankful to the Radcliffe Institute um, for this time and this space to, um, to, to do my work, to work on this project, to nurture a new project, um, and for the opportunity to be and work with such a phenomenal group of people. I, I really um, am thankful for that opportunity. Uh, at the 2016 Super Bowl, <laughs> Beyonce <laughs> performed her new single, Formation, um, with a league of women with afros dressed in black and berets behind her an obvious homage to the Black Panther Party, which celebrates its 50th anniversary this year, Beyonce's Super Bowl performance reflects a renewed popular interest in the Black Power Movement. The controversial performance resulted in many critiques, ranging all the way from a critique of her use of the Black Power Movement's legacy for her own fame and fortune, um, to concerns that she brought the image of a racist group to America's sport. Um, regardless of one's position on the Queen Bee, in this historical moment where black people must proclaim the value of their lives against state violence and the prison industrial complex is being analyzed and challenged by black academics and activists, it is most certainly a fitting time to revisit a movement that was centrally concerned with police brutality and with mass incarceration. It becomes even clearer why it's essential to look again at black power when we remember the movement that black students are waging um, against campus racism across the country. As the movement that inspired students and faculty um, to demand black studies programs and black student unions and demand not just access but space in our universities, it's no surprise that black power, again, is taking a prominent role in the popular imaginary. Perhaps most importantly, though, the Black Power Movement occurred on the cusp of a new form of racism, a form of racism that continues to exist and shapeshift against the backdrop of alleged legal equality. This period in the development of a post-civil rights racial ideology, one that's strikingly similar to what we have today, offers an important comparative landscape for understanding black movements today um, and for understanding white resistance to those movements. Sorry to take Beyonce away from you. <laughs> um, so what I want to do today is to talk to you a bit about my work on the Black Power Movement. So my research grew out of a curiosity about whether and how movements shape that wide range of institutions that exist between the level of the state and the level of the family. Things like schools, workplaces, churches, voluntary associations, and so forth. The places where our day-to-day -day lives take place. And I'm particularly interested in how black people in the US embedded in white dominated educational institutions and workplaces bring the ideas, strategies, and tactics of black liberation movements with them. In this vein, my work has primarily been concerned with how black power made an impact on institutions. Um, in my first book, I argue that the rise of black professional associations um, in the late 1960s and early 70s is a direct outcome of black power, and I detail that process in the profession of social work. <coughs> My second book that I'm working on here at Radcliffe is about a group of attorneys who organized themselves to be the legal wing of the revolution during the black power era. Um, I have a second line of research that looks at race-based policy in higher education. Um, I've been interested in how colleges and universities use or fail to use policy in the service of racial equity, um, and, and in particular in the role of campus activism in shaping that process. So in some ways, my work is a departure from the image of the black power movement that Beyonce channeled at the Super Bowl. Um, to be sure, the black power movement has been portrayed as the quintessential bad boy of black movement making, all Afros, black leather and guns, the black power movement lives in the popular imaginary as a deviant wild child of black social movements. As a new student of the movement, I was also fascinated with this image, um, the image of a, the young radical emerging from the disappointments of the civil rights movement with a new attitude, a new swagger, if you will, ready to take on white racism by any means necessary. 
Um, there's certainly an affinity between my generation, the hip hop generation, and the black power generation that drove my initial interest in the movement. So I used to ha just have pictures here, but then when I learned how to loop Beyonce, I was like, why wouldn't I loop them too? So <laughs> anyway, <laughs> now you get public enemy as well. Um, so much of hip hop culture in the late 1980s and early uh, 1990s reflects an admiration of the black power figures who were willing to risk everything, to say enough is enough. So if you know hip hop, you can think back to KRS-One or Public Enemy who you see projected here and the way that their music and their visual presence reflected a black power ethic. Um, a problem though with this image and with this fascination is that it's really limited the way that we remember the movement um, and certainly how we think about the impact that it's had on US society. We look at the Black Panther Party and groups like them and say, well, they certainly had an impact on black culture. Things like popularizing, repopularizing the Afro, the idea that black is beautiful, new forms of music, et cetera, but not much beyond that. But there is more to the movement than this. There's also a strain of black power that was centrally concerned with institution building. The idea of building independent black institutions is, a, is an old one in black America, and the black power movement was centrally concerned with it. So if this were 1969 or 1970, and we were in a movement-related meeting, and I asked you, what time is it in the call and response tradition of the black community, the answer is, it's nation time. Meaning that the movement called for black people to build the kinds of structures and institutions that go into building a nation. Economic stability, education, faith, family, in a way that would benefit black people. So my first book project, again, looks at the rise of black professional associations as this sort of outcome of the black power movement. And I see that development as the same sort of phenomenon as the rise of black studies programs, black student unions, black museums, independent black educational institutions, and so forth. These are the sorts of outcomes that resulted from black power's push to both carve out space in existing institutions and build new independent institutions. And the strain of the movement is less understood. So what I wanna do moving forward is talk just a little bit about how social science is particularly guilty of underestimating um, the impact of black power, how we can contribute to fixing that by rethinking race-based movements in particular. Um, and then I wanna use some data from the book to talk about how black power shaped the rise of black professional associational life before giving you just a little bit about my work in progress. So sociologists have been particularly dismissive of, of black power. Um, it's really been treated as an aside to civil rights. And that it's, it, it had been seen as really only important in as much as it affected the civil rights movement. Um, that it lent credibility to the more moderate demands of civil rights. With very few exceptions, the sociological literature on social movements has been guilty of ignoring the lasting impacts of the movement, or worse, lumping black power activists together as sort of a ragtag group of unorganized thugs. In fact, Doug McAdam cites Peter Goldman with no qualification when he calls the black power movement a quote, ghetto bread generation with reputations no larger than a single city or neighborhood or even a particular block. And as it turns out, that's just not true. This is primarily because sociologists have made many studies of race-based movements without paying attention to race. And as, <laughs> and as a result, um, sociologists have mostly thought about movement impacts as changes at the level of the state. So what matters about the civil rights movement is that there was legislation that came as a result of it. But what race scholars know is that the social relations that create, maintain, and reproduce racial inequality are embedded throughout society. In other words, racial meanings and racism are not only outcomes of state-initiated processes, nor are they simply ideas that people can choose to ascribe to or not. Rather, racial meanings and racism are developed and expressed in and through the organizations and institutions in which we all interact. So when we understand that power is dispersed throughout society, 
and that race and racism shape all social institutions, we necessarily have to look at how race-based movements impact these other institutions. Um, so in the book, I developed this idea of civil institutionalization to get at this idea that movements get imported into the institutions of civil society. And this is certainly the case with black power. So the roots of the black power movement began much earlier than the 1966 date that most of us attribute to it. Um, US black radicalism certainly didn't begin in 1966, nor did the idea of black nationalism or a movement for black social, political, and economic power begin then. Still, the popular narrative is one in which black radicals emerged on the scene near the end of what Peniel Joseph calls the heroic period of the civil rights movement. Um, the reality is that there have always been at least two connected and sometimes opposing black political cultures. One that sees assimilation or integration into the white mainstream as an appropriate goal for African Americans, and another that promotes the rejection of white institutions, norms, and values. So really, as the civil rights movement gave way to black power in the mid-1960s, this second, more radical political culture came into dominance. And following on the heels of the Watts Rebellion of 1965, Black power gave voice to a generation, um, a generation of black people who wanted more, more than the civil rights movement was asking for, and certainly more than the establishment was willing to give. But more than this, black power rejected the peaceful, nonviolent approach of the civil rights movement, claiming instead that black liberation was an immediate emergency matter of survival, the black power movement threw off the decorum of someone like King and chose to speak plainly, forcefully, and without regard for white feelings. So just briefly, black power as a movement took many forms um, and was made up of a wide range of individuals and organizations. But at the core, the black power movement marked a, a move away from the goals of integration that were central to civil rights and toward a desire for radical social change, a focus on self-help and self-defense in the black community, and a rejection of white aesthetic, cultural norms and values. Self-definition, self-determination, and black pride were central to black power. And concrete struggles over community control over organizations within black communities, struggles around police brutality, welfare reform, all occurred under the umbrella of black power. So while the images I showed earlier of groups like the Black Panther Party dominate how we think about the movement, there was more to the movement than those images that dominated news reports and FBI surveillance reports. <laughs> there was a strain of the movement that was aimed at dismantling institutionalized racism. Stokely Carmichael, later Kwame Ture, and Charles Hamilton wrote a book called Black Power. And in it, they explicated one of the first social science theories of institutionalized racism. The idea that racial meanings and racial inequality become embedded in institutions, um, they become embedded in institutional practices, and are not necessarily dependent on racist attitudes. Um, the book also makes the case that black people need a twofold strategy. One, to have black community representatives within existing institutions to represent black interests, and two, to build independent black institutions. So this notion that black people need to close ranks was certainly not new, but the call in Black Power, the book, really reflects and sets an agenda for this institution building element of the movement and was manifested in all sorts of organizations and within American politics. So as the idea of black power was popularized, established black leaders attempted to define it politically, leading to a series of black power conferences. The most well-known um, black power conference was held between July 20th and July 23rd of 1967, in the wake of one of the bloodiest black rebellions in US history. Lasting from July 11th until July 17th, the Newark rebellion had left over 20 people dead and at least 1,000 injured. So as you can imagine, there was some <coughs> conflict over the timing of the conference. Uh, still, over 1,000 delegates 
and representatives from 286 organizations attended this first National Black Power Conference. The conference document opens with this basis for action. Whereas the black people stand at the crossroads of either an expanding revolution or ruthless extermination, it is incumbent upon us to set our house in order. And whereas black people have consistently expended too much energy and resources reflecting to white definitions, it is imperative that organizational and technical competence develop to initiate and enact new insights, new definitions, and new programs. The Black Power Conferences built a power base and an organizational vehicle for the development of black political conventions um, and a stronger black presence in mainstream politics. And this idea of black faces in higher places, or what I'm calling the black radical march through the institutions, was a central theme. So the impact of the black power movement on black participation in mainstream electoral politics is clear. From the election of black mayors to the development of the Congressional Black Caucus, black power's theme of building political and institutional power shaped African American participation in the US political mainstream. What you see up here is um, Ebony Magazine's progress report. Every January, they published a progress report for the year before. And the story of the year for 1967 was the election of black mayors in cities across, um, in cities across the United States. But the nation-building strain of the black power movement was not only played out in the political arena. From the rise of black studies programs, the development of black student unions, the creation of independent uh, black educational institutions, black theaters, and black museums, African Americans used the fuel of the black power movement to develop independent black institutions throughout civil society. And this phenomenon is important not only because it changed the organizational structure of civil society, but also because it created important shifts um, in racial practices in organizations and contributed to the greater incorporation of the black middle class into white institutions. But in the literature on the movement, very little is known about this process. And let, let me just say here that this importation of black power into mainstream organizations certainly contributed to a watering down of black power in such a way that its transformatory potential would be co-opted into something that looks more like today's diversity initiatives than what it looked like at its most revolutionary. Still, this process of translating and incorporating tenets of the black power movement into major institutions in US society created important shifts that are important to understand. So in the 1960s, large cohorts of African Americans entered several academic and professional disciplines. Their numbers were unprecedented, and they were the immediate products of the civil rights and black power movements. Um, and these professionals were often not satisfied with just integrating their professions with their bodies, with just demographic integration. On the contrary, they came to their professions with a desire to make changes on behalf of the black community. They wanted to use the professions as a tool for black liberation, indeed for black power. But they encountered professional structures that had been operating on a logic of exclusion, many of which they had been formed for the purpose of exclusion and as such were resistant to change and often unprepared for an unwelcoming of integration, not to mention black power. So across the country, groups of black professionals empowered by the legal and social gains of the civil rights movement and inspired and emboldened by black power sought to implement the gains of the movement into their professions. And this process was widespread. There's no expectation for you to read all of this. I just put this list here um, as a, so you can see magnitude. <coughs> um, these are just foundings of professional associations. And the National Professional Associations of Black Psychologists, Journalists, Sociologists, Economists, Social Workers, Firefighters, Political Scientists, Accountants, and Librarians, just to name a few, were all formed between 1968 and 1976. And this is just simple counts, the chart to show you um, that the professional association, the founding of black professional associations maps onto what we think about as the black power era. And all these organizations had as their explicit goals to both change their profession for the good of black professionals within them, but also to change their profession's relationship 
and practice with the black community. These organizations were not the first black professional associations, but they were created under very different circumstances than their predecessors. The National Medical Association and the National Bar Association, for example, were not necessarily formed because they wanted a racially oriented organization, as is evidenced by sort of the national uh, parallel names to their American counterparts. They were formed because African Americans were excluded from the American counterparts. In contrast, the black power era, black professional associations were born out of unprecedented access to white ones. The increased access to white dominated professions and professional associations coincided with the dominance of black power politics in a way that led black professionals to bring the movement with them. The black power influence on these organizations is clear. Um, they all saw to move away from integration as the primary goal of black action within the professions. They already had that. In favor of seeking self-determination for black professionals and black communities. The founders of these organizations worked in the black power tradition of challenging white racism. They reflected black power's change in tenor from the civil rights movement, which no longer saw the removal of barriers as enough. They didn't shy away from demanding black representation within their professions or from labeling longstanding um, professional practices as racist. If you look at these organizations, many of them to this day have red, black, and green logos, the colors of black nationalism. Many were founded with 10 or 12 point platforms um, reflecting the strategy uh, or the tactic of the Black Panther Party uh, and other black power organizations. Another commonality is that these organizations were not founded quietly. They took over meetings, they issued manifestos, they made demands, they insisted. These organizations were formed in and served as the vehicle for protest within the professions. The uh, Association of Black Psychologists, for example, was formed in September of 1968. Um, they issued a series of demands for the American Psych uh, Psychological Association, the APA. And the demands clearly reflect a black power ethic. Um, the, for one, they demanded that the APA bring to bear its full resources on finding solutions to the problem of racism and poverty and recognize that a significant part of research emphasis must be shifted away from the total preoccupation with the ghetto as a source of problems to consideration of the forces within the larger white community that contribute so heavily to the maintenance of the status quo. And when the newly formed organization disrupted the annual meetings of the APA in 1969, they argued that the black community had served as a research colony for social scientists. Robert Greene argued that psychologists, this is a quote, psychologists and sociologists go into the black community and do research, but refuse to specify and push major programs of improvement for the black community. He went on to say, do not use us for research efforts any longer. Help us instead to mitigate the effects of white racism. Black librarians organized the Black Caucus of the American Library Association in 1969. The statement of concern that they presented um, at, to the American Library Association, the ALA, in 1970, also reflected this black power ethic. In their brief statement, they assert, black librarians are especially concerned about the effects of institutional racism, poverty, the continued lack of educational, employment and promotional opportunities for blacks and other minorities. And in a condemnation of the discipline, they referenced the 1968 report of the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders, or the Kerner Commission report, arguing that although these socioeconomic ills have been condemned by the Kerner Commission, the Commission on Violence and many other studies, the library profession has been slow in responding to these problems. Um, and you might be wondering, what do they expect the library profession to do, right? Um, and so I'm going to give you an example of sort of, uh, and I think it's a, a, a really clear example of this idea of translating the goals of the movement into their professional lives. So the first official resolution they pushed through the ALA Council was in response to library practices in segregated schools. So the founders of the Black Caucus were troubled by the number of private schools that were founded in the United States in order to avoid integration. These schools were the result of white flight 
after the Civil Rights Movement, and many of the new white schools couldn't afford their own libraries. And so they asked local libraries to support them. Black caucus founders saw this as a prime opportunity to hold their profession accountable for the gains of the movement, for supporting school integration, and uh, asked them to refuse to support these white flight schools. After a heated debate, the Black Caucus was successful in passing the following resolution. That the libraries or librarians who do in fact through their services or materials support any such racist institution be censured by the American Library Association and that the ALA staff give the widest possible publicity to this action. So the black, this Black Caucus resolution is a prime example of how black power era professionals creatively translated the goals and ethic of black power into their disciplinary context. So these are just two examples um, of how black power era professionals brought the ideas and strategies of the movement um, into their professions and mounted a challenge against institutional racism. But I also find that black professional associations of the era served four important purposes um, within their professions. First, they did identity work. So I saw a lot of um, this sort of talking and writing around what does it mean to be really black and a professional? So what is it, and, and by really black, meaning committed to black liberation, committed to the movement and a professional at the same time. Secondly, um, that they served as a protest wing. So black professional associations were often and continue to be um, more willing to engage in activist uh, social justice activities than are their mainstream counterparts. The third is a focus on professional equality. So holding, uh, so challenging practices that unfairly benefited um, uh, their white colleagues in promotion or in being placed on committees, things like that. And then the last thing I talk about is uh, monitors. So that they sort of served as um, the black conscience within the profession. So if there were practices of a profession that uh, they thought harmed the black community, uh, APA, for example, the Black Caucus of Black, Psycho uh, Caucus of black Psych Association of Black Psychologists, um, had, they called for a moratorium on IQ testing of black children um, because IQ tests un unfairly um, uh, were unfairly biased against black kids in school. So this was one of these sort of being a monitor about the, the, organ the profession's practices. In short, black professionals during the black power era uh, turned the black power gaze onto their work lives to challenge racism within their professions. Um, black people in the US, shaped by the movement, um, fought for black studies departments, the development of Afrocentric curricula and various educational endeavors, representation on the boards of directors and organizations serving black communities, and greater racial diversity and sensitivity in organizations of all sorts. And this element of black power, the work that African Americans did within all sorts of organizations to bring the ideas of the movement into them um, is uh, a process that's less understood. Um, but it is one that I think is essential to understanding not only how these institutions changed over time, but also the resistance, even by liberal whites, to those changes. As the black struggle shifted from calls for colorblind, neutral equality of opportunity to color conscious calls for equality of condition, delivered in the urgent tone of black power, white resistance also shifted mostly by using colorblind rhetoric and policy in ways that maintain and continues to maintain white supremacy. Before I close, I want to talk just a little bit about my new project, um, uh, Black Power Lawyers. But because I'm still working through the data, um, I'll talk just a little bit about the framework um, and my research process so far. It's still early, but I don't want to miss the opportunity to, to hear your feedback and questions at this point. So my new project is about the National Conference of Black Lawyers, NCBL, um, a group that formed in 1968 with the express goal to be the legal wing of the revolution. Um, I came across this organization when I was doing uh, work on my last book, looking, uh, looking for black professional associations, that big list you saw up there. Um, 
And I was, my interest was sort of piqued. And when I looked further, I realized that they were explicitly tied to black power. And I was immediately curious about them um, because I had never thought about black power as having a legal wing or a legal strategy. Um, but as I thought more about the extreme state repression of the movement and the court cases that resulted from it, it was clear that the movement had to engage with the law and with the courts. Um, and so I found that the papers of NCBL are housed at Howard University. Several of the other um, archives have manuscript collections related to black power era legal cases. The Schomburg holds the Angela Davis defense collection, for example. Um, and many NCBL attorneys have papers collected in repositories across the country. So I visited most of them and started the process of collecting oral histories um, with attorneys who were active in this organization in the period that I'm interested in. So as a whole, the book will make the argument that the black power movement had a legal wing, um, which is a sort of necessary empirical argument um, given the way that we think about black power so far. Um, that there's a such thing as black power law and lawyers who practiced it. The book spans the period from 1968 to 1977 and includes, for example, elements of the defense of Angela Davis, Asada Shakur, Joanne Little, and the Attica brothers. I end my time period with NCBL's involvement in the Baki affirmative action case in 1977. I look at uh, career effects of defending unpopular clients, the organization's global advocacy, and their work on behalf of black law students and in defense of black lawyers who found themselves facing disciplinary charges. So the piece that I'm working on right now, uh, and sort of in the mix of trying to figure out, um, I'm calling Kangaroo Court, the courtroom as a space of resistance. Um, in 1977, Lennox Hines, who was then director of the National Conference of Black Lawyers and Rutgers criminal justice professor, held a press conference while court was in session for the trial of Asada Shakur. In it, he characterized the trial as a legalized lynching by a kangaroo court. For his remarks, he was charged with violating Middlesex um, uh, ethics committee rule uh, 7107D, which, quote, restricts the speech of attorneys who are associated with pending criminal litigation by sanctioning attorneys for making any extrajudicial extra judicial statement um, that they expect to be disseminated to the public and that is reasonably likely to interfere with a fair trial. In the end, arguing that he was not the attorney of record and that the rule unfairly restricted his First Amendment rights, Hines succeeded in having the charges dropped and actually brought a suit of his own against the Ethics Committee. Um, but his statements are representative of a, a genre of black movement politics um, that has yet to be given much scholarly attention, and that's courtroom resistance. What I'm finding is that the National Conference of Black Lawyers, um, attorneys, and oftentimes their clients, conceived of the courtroom as a space for carrying out this movement, from pushing the boundaries of what was acceptable speech about court cases, as in the Heinz case I just told you about, to using strategic disrespect of trial judges as a resistance tactic, to making incredible advances in the use of social science and jury selection. NCBL attorneys use their position as attorneys in the service of black power. So I wanna just conclude with this. So there's no doubt that the black power movement still inspires young people. And it's not just Beyonce at the Super Bowl or Kendrick Lamar at the Grammys. The Black Lives Matter movement and the new black student movement is all raised fists, Asada taught me, and by any means necessary, even in the face of white tears. And the resistance that the movement faces is quite predictable when you understand the racial dynamics of colorblind racism. I'm still wrapping my head around these connections, but they're quite striking, really. So for me as a student of social movements, it's not so much about whether black power has a lasting legacy, but about how and to what end. And my work tries to deal with these questions, but beyond this, knowing that so many black people see 2016 as so similar to 1966 should raise many more curiosities and quite frankly should give us all pause. Thank you. Thank you.